we know that the work of ending once and for all white supremacy, white people's work in doing that is the bedrock for everything that needs to happen in this country. If we can put racism and white supremacy in a coffin, then we might be able to tackle all of these other things, whether it be climate change, Trump's Project 2025, nine plus months of genocide in Gaza, all of these things come back to the conversation that these two brilliant leaders have devoted their lives to. And so it really, really is an honor for us to be in this space together with Reverend Dr. Jackie Lewis and Reverend Dr. Jennifer Harvey. So can we just start with a big round of applause for these powerhouses? And I do feel very weird, like standing in front of you. I hope you can see them. Um, uh, just a few housekeeping things before we dive right in. There are restrooms right here, all gender restrooms through this door. We are recording this evening. So if you wouldn't mind, if you need to use the restroom, go towards the back and then around this way. We'll leave this space up here for our featured guests. Um, if you, we will have a time for Q&A at the end. So think about during their conversation, is there, if there's a burning question that you have, think about what that is. If you'd like to go ahead and write it down, there are post-it notes in the back um, that Jillian has, and you can write it down so you don't forget it. And if it um, turns out that we don't have time to, to have hands raised, if we see your written question, we might be able to ask it a little more easily. We are live streaming this. So let's say hello to the folks online. We are at, at Rev Jackie Lewis's Instagram page. So if you were wishing that someone was here with you, I know I am. You can go online right now and um, share Jackie Lewis's Instagram. And we will also at Middle Church share this link out on YouTube in a more formatted way um, at a date soon. I think I've gotten all my housekeeping. Elise? Yes? Okay. Well, then without further ado, let me give you all a little bit more of an official bio here. We'll start with Jackie Lewis. The Reverend Dr. Jackie Lewis is senior minister and public theologian at Middle Church here in New York City, celebrated internationally for her dynamic preaching and commitment to justice. She champions racial equity, equality, economic justice, and LGBTQIA plus gender rights. Featured on MSNBC, PBS, NBC, CBS, NPR, any other acronym. No, I'm just kidding. She's the author of Fierce Love, which is right here, and the Just Love Story Bible, which is an advanced copy phase right now, but it's really amazing. We don't have a, a little thing of that, do we? Um, her transformative work inspires countless individuals and communities on stages, churches, on the street, and in the digital spaces around the world. Jackie Lewis! <laughs> And the Reverend Dr. Jennifer Harvey is an author, educator, and widely sought out public speaker who currently serves as Vice President for Academic Affairs and Academic Dean at Garrett Evangelical Seminary. I feel like there's a story there. <laughs> that was a little laugh or something. Having written for numerous publications, her passion for intersectional justice has focused most deeply on white anti-racism. Harvey's books include the New York Times bestseller, Raising White Kids, Dear White Christians. Her newest book, Anti-Racism as Daily Practice, which I think releases tomorrow. Officially tomorrow. You didn't know you were at a book launch also, or maybe you did. Exploring how white Americans can change their everyday behaviors to confront racism in their spheres of influence. There we go. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Amanda. Jen, I'm just going to start off by telling you how thrilled I am to be uh, at the top of this launch with you. Uh, your books, your two books on racism, the Raising White Kids and um, Anti-Racism America, all of that stuff just cracked my heart wide open hearing from a white woman writing with such a clarity, a precision, passion about my dream which is to build an anti-racist nation and, and an anti-racist globe. I'm so grateful to you for what you do in the world. And we're thrilled that you're here today. Absolutely thrilled. 
Thank you so much for being willing to be with me on stage. And I am thrilled to be here and in New York. And we're sitting in the church I was ordained in, actually. I had to share that because I'm pretty excited about that. Um, so thank you. And thank you for your work and long time journey of public witness and showing up and leading us. It matters so much. Thank you. Should we tell people what we're gonna do? You want you want to we're, we're gonna do things. We're gonna we're <laughs> gonna do some stuff. We're gonna um, Jen's gonna lead us off uh, talking about why she wrote this book and what's in this book and why it matters to her. And that the personal is political. So I'm so grateful that we'll start there. And then I'll make some comments uh, from the perspective of my uh, Fierce Love book, but in conversation with what Jen puts out. And then we really want to talk to you, so we'll have some Q&A that Amanda and Zane are going to help us do, and then we're going to sign books. That's the Dale Carnegie version of what's going to happen. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks. I'm going to kick us off. So um, I, a little bit about why or where this particular book came from. And then I'm going to read a little section of it that when I was reading Jackie's book, Fierce Love, this particular section in my own book, it surprised me when I wrote about it. Just the connection just seemed really deep. So back in 2014, I had just finished writing a book called Dear White Christians for those still longing for racial reconciliation. And I wrote that book because as a white Christian myself for 15 years, I had like lots of other white folks said, why is our church not more diverse? And why is it that we can't seem to get across the 11 o'clock is the most segregated hour thing? And in the course of my own ruminating on those questions, I started realizing, oh, because reparation has to come before reconciliation. And so I wrote Dear White Christians about that to the church, to the predominantly white church. And just as happenstance in terms of timing, it came out one month after Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson. And so I quickly found myself um, pulled into lots and lots of teaching spaces with predominantly white churches about reparative justice, police brutality. So there was a bunch in, in direct questions about police brutality in my own journey in anti-police brutality um, organizing in New York, which I learned in New York initially in the 90s. And as I was in those spaces, I suddenly found myself in the dialogue, having folks engage with that work, but then start to say, oh, always it would come up. Okay, so we're, we're going to do this work. We're doing this work. This is what it looks like. What do we do with our children, our white kids? And I was like, let me find a book on that. <laughs> and so I started looking and there was not a book on that. And then I thought, wait a second, I'm raising two white kids. What am I doing with my kids? And so Raising White Kids was born out of dialogue in predominantly white communities about what the need was for the next layer of skills and capacity building. It wasn't because I was, you know, trained in psychology, as you are. It was because I was parenting and thinking, what am I doing? What should I be doing? What does it look like to do this? So Raising White Kids came out of that conversation. And Again, two, three years, even then through the course of the pandemic, it's showing up in virtual spaces with communities engaging that book. I started hearing over and over from white communities, okay, so here's this book for our children and our parenting. And as I read it, I realized I need to completely reparent myself. I don't have the skills, capacity, and tools that I'm now part of the reason we needed this book is because the adults don't have it. And so Anti-racism as daily practice started to germinate there for me out of conversations in white communities about what the need was. And so 2020 happened. George Floyd was murdered. People took to the streets saying Breonna Taylor's name. More white folks than I'd ever seen in my own community were in the streets. And I had already been thinking about this particular book that was more sort of geared towards, you know, adult learning about daily practices. And in 2020, it dawned on me, okay, we've got this mass infusion of white, some sort of moral curiosity. And I know because I'm white myself that once the moral curiosity begins, there's still a whole lot of confusion and mess up and need for mentoring and care. And because I walked it and I... So I thought, okay, maybe there's a need for a resource that would speak to that in this. And secondly, so that was the first part of why I wrote this new book. The second part was in that I wanted to really make visible 
to other white folks, the clunkiness the, of the journey, the longevity of it, how the day-to-day -day attempt to build skills and build relationships looks, because we have these beautiful checklists now in anti-racism. You know, you're supposed to center people of colors, voices, and experiences. You're supposed to pass the mic. You're supposed to, the checklist, good stuff, truthful stuff. And what does it look like in the day-to-day? -day? Like, so I wanted to make transparent what my messy walk has been. And so there's a lot of stories in the book trying to just show my fellow white folks, like, this is what happens when you're at the dinner table and someone says something terrible. And this is what happens a month later when you try and go back to that same family. So that was the second reason. The third thing I wanted to really say to other white folks about, and that I sort of prompted this particular book, is that I have felt increasingly aware in white anti-racism spaces that we've got a lot of intellectual capacity around anti-racism. And it's very individualistic and very much like, I know all of these things. And to win this global movement for multiracial justice, we have to change white communities. We have to, white folks have to get better at engaging, pulling in, talking to our parents, our siblings, our coworkers, and not just thinking about our individual anti-racist commitments. Last thing behind this book is I also wanted to say a little bit, um, this probably feels like the most vulnerable part of the book about some concerns I have about some of the ways white anti-racist culture is emerging right now. So I, there's, a, there's some pieces in there about the way I've even experienced myself some use and weaponizing of shame of white folks to other white folks. Not speaking to how people of color engage white folks, that's not my conversation, but I've been in enough spaces where I've started to watch those of us who are white feel the temptation because we want to stay pure in our anti-racism, like, oof, not only do I not want to engage that one, Maybe if I publicly throw a little shame at them, it'll make clear I'm really correct. And besides the dangers and the sort of limited moral vision of that, which is it's a false response rooted in our own shame, actually, it also will destroy our movements. We have to grow the movement. We can't shrink it. So thus the book was born. Um, so if it's okay, can I read a little section of it? Okay. So... I, 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 I'm going to read a part, actually, that's about family um, with, with the undercurrent of it naming that there's a lot in this book about organizing and movement building, and it's not all interpersonal, but one of the many things I love about Fierce Love is the way the interpersonal relationships that we have that are difficult, that are messy, that require truth-telling is so connected to our structural realities. It's all connected. And so I thought the way I was... Some of your stories in Fierce Love, I just thought, oh, this story is the perfect story because you talk about truth-telling, releasing energy to help us find a way forward and in relationships. I'm going to read a bit of a story about my own experience with that in family because in the conversations I have with white folks, one of the questions that always comes up, what do we do about our extended families? What do we do about our extended families? So I'm going to just read excerpts about one way I have tried to think about that. My older child started talking really early, and during the years she was finding so many words, H also spent a fair amount of time at her grandparents' house. Grandma and Grandpa loved her very much, and the occasional breaks from the grind of parenting a toddler with an infant in tow were a godsend to my then partner and I. We were very, very tired. During the same years she was finding so many words, H also had a beloved baby doll. Her doll was black. One day, H came home after a weekend with the grandparents. In a random moment of play, she picked up her doll, held it in the air, and said to me and Chris, Black baby. Chris and I looked at each other. What? To be clear, we weren't concerned H might be noticing and naming the doll's race. We've attempted to raise our two white children in a race-conscious, justice-affirming way since birth. But H's language and tone didn't signal that type of healthy affirmation of all kinds of visible differences. Plus, while we had said things like, look at this baby's beautiful brown skin, or of another doll, this baby has beautiful peach skin, we'd never referred to the doll in that way, just as we hadn't referred to any of her dolls with white skin as white baby. We suspected H was mimicking a reference to her doll 
made by families she'd just been with and that the references that the reference hadn't been made in authentic celebration. So now we had to decide what to do. Our white families got exposed in 2016 and the exposure has continued ever since. Myriads of white Americans who were fully horrified by Donald Trump and his racist hate had family members who voted him into office. Whereas the political differences had been somewhere on a spectrum of reasonable people can disagree, now a willingness to align with hate was sitting next to us at the extended family meal table. Add to this to the political pressure cooker we're all living in, combined with a growing culture of disdain for attempts to engage meaningfully about our current state of civic affairs and, well, presto. The temptation to not go home at all or to go but keep it short and our mouths shut shot off the charts. I remember talking with Chris about whether we'd join the usual Christmas celebration a month after the election. This would have been to the black baby branch of our eclectically grafted family tree. Our absence would have created shockwaves. We'd known full well racism was already in the room. We'd engaged with it along with homophobia in various ways for years by that point, but the intensity of pain and the feelings of betrayal accompanying the realization that the people who raised you and loved up on your kids would vote for someone so maliciously out to get you and those same kids was almost unbearable. I also didn't want to sit anywhere near one particular brother-in-law, let alone try to be Yuletide gay. I have, I've heard white people from nearly every age group, class bracket, and educational background in so many parts of the country talk about how tough or how much tougher family gatherings became after 2016. This means, of course, the conditions enabling that white vote were already in the room. The election revealed a long existing failure to invest deeply in racially just changed in our most intimate or at least most long-term family relationships. White racial bonding has long been alive and well in white families. For just as long, the many of us who wanted to check or challenge it have found ourselves caught in the sticky web of white silence. It's also reasonable then to see white families as powerful places for civic impact. Transformed white family networks have the potential to enable collective and generational changes we must have. Families aren't and can't be the only places, but they are powerful places. So what do we do with them? My response to what do we do looks something like this. We need to stay in it, then stay in it again, and then we need to stay in it some more until it's clearly time to leave. Here are some of my, very, of my own very imperfect, very incomplete, and frankly, very vulnerable experiences of trying with all of my flawed might simply to stay. White silence tempts us to put our heads down and hope red flags will go away. They won't. We knew we couldn't let the black baby comment slide. I remember saying to Chris, um, so you or me, rock, paper, scissors? We also knew it didn't matter whether we could succeed in explaining to the grandparents what wasn't okay about what they'd said about the doll. We needed to address it regardless. But we did strategize. For example, I kept thinking how bad it would have felt if black family members had been present when H had said that. Could we humanize the harm of othering a doll with the tone just channeled through H's sweet little toddler mouth? Could we ask them to imagine how our nephews or sister-in-law would have experienced that moment? We also practiced. It's not bad to notice this doll is black and beautiful. We want H to learn that, but it's not okay to use the word black to imply something about this doll isn't just as normal and good as her other dolls. And it seems like maybe that's what you did. Mostly we just agreed ahead of time that whatever happened, a boundary needed to be set. Chris called nervously. We need to talk. Then off she went. It was not an easy conversation. Actually, that's an understatement. The conversation was a disaster. The grandparents were not gentle with her or curious about her concern. They denied there was anything wrong with what they'd said. Every attempt to explore that claim with them only made it clearer something was definitely wrong with what they'd said. They weren't receptive to that feedback either. Also, see above, hard family dynamics showed up in a major way. Long-standing tendencies by one parent to show up with condescension and barely sublimated anger when anyone forgot their place and challenged him, combined with challenging dynamics between the two parents, one parent more receptive to learning but committed to not breaking ranks with the other. 
This is how it felt on our side anyway. The grandparents might remember differently, and I wasn't there. But I did hold space as Chris described how her attempt to lean in and explain had landed her on the receiving end of acrimony and accusation. She didn't get through. Eventually, she had to just end the not conversation. Well, we're not going to have this, she said. Whether you get it or not, if you want H to come over, you can't talk about Black people like that. If you won't agree, you can't be around her unsupervised. They were pissed. Over the next few days, a series of furtive phone calls took place, usually initiated by Grandma, who was trying to broker a peace deal. None got far. Then a call, initiated by Grandpa, went so sideways that Chris ended the whole thing. Look, I'm not talking about this anymore. You'll either agree or you won't. After that, we didn't hear from them for three full months. Three uncomfortable, angsty months. Three months with no childcare breaks. Three months during which a confused toddler missed her grandparents. And then, about as abruptly, we won. One day they just called. Okay, it won't happen again. Can we see H? Thanks. Thanks for this one. So, transforming circumstances with moral courage, truth telling to release energy, and another thing you said in your book confronting hard things is the only way to make real change. And that was just going through my mind and heart as I was reading Fierce Love and that particular story held those pieces. Thanks for your work. Thanks for your work. I love that. I keep in my mind when I read your book, I think I'm always in my mind going, I want to see you be brave. Like I'm singing the song in my mind about wanting to see people be brave. Jen, you are brave and committed and clear. And it has to be like that. Uh, social science says um, a new vision contradicts an old vision. A, a new vision makes an old vision feel sad, angry, hurt. But the new vision that we have to curate together as humans on the planet is one in which we understand each other's ethnicity as a gift to the universe. And that because we feel that way, we live that way. And pretty soon racism is a pastime paradigm, to quote Stevie Wonder. So thank you for you. Um, I promise to tell, uh, to put my conversation about my book in, in the frame of yours. I love the bridge you made there. Um, two things, a story I forgot to put in the book. But when I was a, a youth minister in Trenton, New Jersey, I had the joy of meeting all the little kiddos. And there were Ben and Will belonged to parents with the last name Sapanaro, beautiful, a dancer and a singer. And I'd go to visit them and the kids were just, they loved, they loved being visited. But one, one, uh, one particular Sunday evening, the older boy, Will, had an awakening, right? So he was sitting at the table eating his spaghetti and thinking and looking at me, take a couple bites and look up, take a couple bites and look up and pretty soon he went three of these things belong together from Sesame Street I was like oh, okay this is a foreshadowing <laughs> and so the father says yes that's right um, three, of, three of you were uh, girls and only you know like that kind of thing. nope three of these things belong together and pursued it to sort of say that I was black and it was, a, it was, of course, a toddler's discovery of what is real. What his parents did with that was to do what you hoped would happen with the grandparents here, is yes, Jackie's skin is black. And that means she comes from a different place. And let me tell you all about all the beautiful black people. And I think they did baseball players, basketball players, and they said in musicians. So they used the opportunity of the awkward uh, revelation to teach the kid about race. So awkward revelations, right? Awkward revelations all the time. Um, recently, I was on stage with a couple of colleagues at Wild Goose. And the awkward revelation I had after a while in this panel conversation was whatever I offered, I think that this race thing has everything to do with whatever, biology, or whatever I said. 
And the way we're going to liberate ourselves from these stories is to make new stories, and we can get back to the text of the Bible, and that'll take us there. Like, there was no building, no scaffolding. Like, you and I are scaffolding on each other's work, right? So I, awkwardly, awkward revelation, just came to feel like I'm kind of invisible on this stage. And a younger Jackie would have not done the hard thing. Like, but in everyday anti-racist practice, we actually have to do a hard thing. And the hard thing is to say, this doesn't work for me. So I said that it did not work for me and had a straightforward conversation with my colleagues and then decided that the second half of the talk, I would be back at my room doing my middle church work, which I needed to do. Story number two about the hard thing. Um, third quick story about hard thing is what's in my book. I'm going to hold my book, but I'm not going to read it because it's too long to read. I'm going to say, in this book, I tell a story about my hero, who's my dad, and how very much he was annoyed that I brought my white John home for dinner, if you will. Guess who's coming to dinner? My graduation party for my PhD. Red. And my dad is just furious. He just doesn't like the way John looks. He just doesn't like it. He's white. I don't like the way he looks. And I'm just going to be mean, stank mean, rude mean, embarrassing mean, crawl under your table mean to John in front of my aunts and uncles and cousins and brothers and sisters. I'm like, holy snaps, this is rough. And the hard thing I did was after John left the party, which was a hard thing, was to really confront my dad that you don't really get to treat anybody that way. Kind of, you didn't teach us that when you're doing that. I'm saying these three hard things to say, Jen, black people don't always have as much opportunity to not do the hard thing. Like, black people are doing the hard thing often about race. Um, we're, we're, we're experiencing it, and we're ingesting it, and we take it home as agita or stomach ache, and then we're B-I-T-C-H-ing it at the table with our family and friends, and then we go back and we face it another day. But we are having to face it. And what I really love about, about your book is you are declaring that everyday white people have to do the hard thing if we're going to build an anti-racist world, right? We can't cover for the racism. We can't pretend it's not racism. We can't turn our eyes about the racism. We might piss off our colleagues if we call it out. We might anger our grandparents or cousins if we call it out. But if white people don't participate at that level in anti-racist work where there's willing to be disappointment or disagreement or someone's frowning at you or someone's disapproving of you because you are taking it on, if that's not what happens, then it really won't get better. And um, in the kind of post Trayvon Martin, post Mike Brown, post, you know, Castile, you know, post Ahmaud Arbery, like all of the horrible violence that we've seen in our lifetime toward black people because they're black, built upon all the violence that happened to black people because they were black from the beginning of this nation's founding, like from emancipation, from lynching, and the, like all the reactions to the positive progress, right? I'm just kind of proud that you as a white parent, scholar, teacher, writer, are calling in white people to not just be progressive and think that's wrong, but to really do a thing. And the thing to do is hard. Right? The thing to do is hard. So, I, I guess I could read this. I don't, I don't know. I want you to buy it. <laughs> but buy it. Buy it. But I want to say, hard is how we get well, right? Uh, my dad was a butthead 
sometimes. And the way he got better is because we had confrontations. And what I celebrate about him in this book, where I, is it pour tea, Jillian? Is it spill tea? Thank you. When I spill tea on my dad, I can never get that right. When I spill tea on my dad, and he read the book cover to cover, about a black man growing up in Mississippi who learned to be. We wouldn't say racist because he didn't have enough power, but prejudice, right? In, the, in his life, being wounded by over and over again white people. The, the, the tea I spill um, is about how this hard-hearted lion becomes softer, gentler, kinder, who mothers us when my mother dies because we confront him. And maybe the point I want to make right here is the racism that is the sickness in our nation, and it is a sickness in our nation, that causes oppressed landowners to leave Europe and come here to make a safe place for themselves, but to not notice that the people in the ground are also people because they're indigenous, and to literally write that the land was empty. Laura Ingalls, Little House on the Prairie, that sweet little crock of crap right there. There were no people on the land. They were just Indians. This church I serve, my ecclesiastical ancestors, so-called bought Manhattan from the Lenape. They didn't, that's a lie. Built our churches, maybe even these churches, but our church, built on stolen land by stolen labor. That's just in the, it's just here. And we, you and I know that it's here and it's been here and it did lead to lynching and terror, and it did lead to um, segregation and Jim Crow, and it did lead to economic injustice, and therefore it's still $15 on the 100, the black, like black wealth, $15 on the $100 of white wealth, it's because of the racism that's in the ground, that's in the air we breathe, that's, that then ripples and causes a black boy named Richard Lewis to grow up poor and othered and disenfranchised, you know, and to go to the Air Force to escape Mississippi, but to really bring with him every broken thing. I'm trying to say the racism just also cripples souls, just wipes out hope and just causes despair and anger and over and over and over again. And it, it is why why we are on the cusp of annihilation in our nation because of the racism that grows up a trump. Even that we have to try to have some compassion for, it, even as he beat, even as we beat him in the election. Compassion, but don't vote there. So I'm trying to, you know, just weave those things together for us, both theologically and psychodynamically. But the racism is poison. Right? So I have a question for you about then why love, and I'm going to tell you why I'm asking the question. Fierce love, but like why love, especially when you talk about the violence and the, the, the just generational bloodshed and oppression. And in this moment, it's, it can be very jarring to have a word like love uttered in justice spaces. And so I would love to ask you to talk a little bit about that. And here's my why behind that coming from the work that I'm doing, which is this. I feel myself so, so it is deeply hard. It does take courage. It does take compa being companioned by folks in white spaces to sort of make the decision to show up and show up and show up because the, the the luxury of privilege and insulation is that it becomes a choice, right? It's a deadly, toxic choice. But unlike, you know, you said black folks don't have the option. It's, it's the hard thing every day, right? 
However, even though it is hard and it is, I also feel so in touch with, I get asked, you know, people ask all the time, so why would white folks even want to do this? And, and those many folks in my life I know who've been about that walk for a long time, there's a point at which that question stops making sense because the life-givingness, the liberation, the freedom, something about love that is part of working against the way white supremacy also damages and malforms white, white people is at, at a certain point, at least in my walk, there's a tipping point. It's like, oh, oh, that's the, not, that question doesn't even make sense because I don't want to live anywhere else because now I've been able to experience things that the death feelingness of white whiteness did not allow me to experience. And so for me, the love piece makes sense. But I also like in this political environment, even in our social justice movements, the word love kind of, I got an email the other day, book's not even out. And someone chastised me, said, how dare you use the word love? No one's asking for that. And I was like, yeah, I'm, okay, I hear you. I, I, I disagree, but I hear you. And so I'm just, so that's why, but I, I get the love part, but I would just, the way you talk about love, I just love to hear you like ask you to say a little it's like, why love and how do we keep each other to justice? But why? Why love? Thank you. Uh, um, because it's the only thing that will save us. I mean, that's a kind of existential truth to me. It is the only thing that will save us. And like, you know, you and I are both faith people too. I like to think of us as faithy, right? <laughs> we're, we're faithy. Um, <laughs> doing work in other spaces, but it is the only thing. And as a, as a universalist Christian pastor, I would say love saved my life. You know, I am here on the planet, not because of a dead rabbi on a cross, right? But because love saved my life. I mean, so many times. But in the book, I write about that Canadian woman who had this catastrophic car accident that I survived, and I'm alone in a hospital with no money and parents who are mad because I was dating a white boy. Don't come take care of me. I'm moneyless, carless. I got nothing but trauma and glass in my hair. And this little white lady walks across the, whole, the hospital lobby. And is like, what is wrong with you? <gasps> you know, those ugly cries. And she just stops everything and takes me to a hotel and pays the bill and buys me food and aspirin and picks me up the next morning and drives me back to the hospital. Like, love saved me that night. It was horrible. And love saved me. That's a small example. But the kind of love that I mean that is fierce is also like my mother, like, stop picking up my kid at the playground. I will beat your ass, is what she said. She played it up, but she did. Like a lion. Love. Like, um, my dad, who was all kinds of problematic, but you couldn't do anything without him driving you to the thing or taking you to the thing or showing up at the thing and celebrating you at the thing. How did they get that? These Mississippi raised Jim Crow experienced people who could be just bitter as F, but they just loved us so hard and were loved so hard by their parents. So I think it's the only thing. And I'm teary about it because there's so much hate right now. I mean, I can't believe. I can't believe we have enough hate. I think Donald Trump is like the worst person on the planet. But are we really going to shoot him? And then are we really going to follow the shooting with hate-filled rhetoric? It's just horrible. So it's the only thing. And you know what we're, the kind of love we're talking about that will take risks, that will lay down its self-interest, that will build community, that will go to the polls and vote for each other's people, that will know that if we don't get there together to whatever the promised land is, we're not going. That's what it is. It's the only thing. We have, we have, we're going to do questions in two minutes. Will you respond to my crazy thing I said? <laughs> <laughs> not, not, uh, 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 nothing crazy about it. I mean, I think it's, um, 
I mean, I can't think about the word love without thinking about justice, partly because of the way Dr. King talked about, you know, it's all love, but the public form of love is justice. Justice correcting everything that stands against love, right? Exactly. Beautiful, yeah. And also, the other thing that I really, that I really sort of was living, living into and walking with and and wrestling with that, that I sort of engaged in the book was something my therapist um, said to me a few years ago when she told me that you know, grief is grief is love and I was really angry when she said that and um because I just wanted to be mad and so I shouldn't have to be grieving over things. Of course we all grieve over so many things. Um and then read not there thought not long thereafter Sharon Salzberg was a Buddhist teacher who said grief is love without a place to land. So and maybe. so I started thinking like, oh what is it what would it mean if we you know talk embracing facing our grief, facing the truth of what white communities, what who we have been, what we have done, in like actually grieving, if grief is love, then the work of anti-racism has to do with building a place for love to land, right? If grief is love without a place to land, then when we build that place, we can only do that by truth telling, facing the grief and, and acknowledging it. It's all of it, all of it. And so um so I just love this come to mean something deeper for me in the journey of sort of this iteration of, of my walk in this work and in a world that I do you know, is on fire. And so um, we do need justice and justice language without kindness and love, fierce love, fierce kindness is, you know, it isn't the only, isn't the only thing that we need. Justice without love. And I'm totally going to butcher what King is saying, but I agree with the sentiment of it. Like the justice without love can be authoritarianism. It, it can end up being policing. It can be just straight up judgment, right? But when love is in that, love is like the non-possessive delight in the uniqueness of the other. And, and that's one way to say the, non, the, the non-possessive delight, meaning I don't own you, I don't get to decide for you, I get to join with you. And, and together we get to build a, a place of flourishing. I think love will fix the racism. And I think it starts with loving ourselves. I think most of the racists have a hole in their soul where love should be. But that's a that's a that's another book for another well, actually here. It's in, it's, in, it's in there. It's just easy. It's in here. Right here. Okay. Thank y'all. You ready for some Q&A with us? Let's give another round of applause for that beautiful dialogue. We are um, a small enough crowd that I think we can do this by hand raising if y'all are comfortable. But if you'd rather me read something that you've written, I'm happy to do that as well. And I will ask if you all don't mind to repeat the question because it's hard for the folks online to hear me and the audience. So who would like to start us off? Can I see for you? No. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, How do you integrate neighborhoods? How do you integrate neighborhoods? That's a great question. I'm going to answer quickly and punch it to Jennifer. I think faith communities can help integrate neighborhoods by being compelling enough, joyful enough, good music enough that people can't wait to get to the church and the church is in a neighborhood and that there can be programs that develop from that, kiddo programs, older folks programs um, to do that. But even the secular people can integrate neighborhoods if they, if they understand their calling in, in the world. I decide to live in a neighborhood so my kids can live with black people. I decide to live in a neighborhood so my kids can live with Korean people. That's a choice adults can make. I get to live in a neighborhood so that I, my tax monies change the neighborhood, raise the bar. We can decide that to do that, but it isn't, that's not sociological, that's ethical and that's spiritual. And I think that's our calling. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I would add to that the two things that emerge for me is one, depending on one's context, when you, when you use a phrase like integrate neighborhoods, part of me wants to ask what's underneath that, what's the why, and what's the, 
question underneath that, which I think often has to do with resources. How do we have equitable resources? Because segregation is a result, it's a product of redlining, of, of non-equitable access to wealth, to credit. Um, it shows up in schools. So if we want to talk about integration because we're caring about equitable access to resources, then we talk about plugging in with organizations that are working to change policies and, and do, you know, accountable equity work in our local context. If we're talking about integrating neighborhoods because we want to live in closer proximity to one another and be able to build justice-informed relationships with one another, then that's in some ways much easier, right? Because we can make choices about where we live, who we, who we choose to be neighbors with, where we spend our time. And that, that's, a, that's a related, they encounter and inform one another those kinds of decisions, but both are organizations and daily personal choices we make about how we spend our time, money, resources, and where we hang out. Thank you. Uh, I am really grateful to both of you for these, these, these two books that address very important issues that are so related. And one of the ways that I find them both related is you really center families um, and you center children and, and how we are raising and thinking about young people um, in your books. And as I'm navig navigating my way through young adulthood, I'm thinking a lot about what it's going to mean for me to be an anti-racist parent one day. And as I go through this process, like Jen, I'm realizing there are ways that I need to repair it myself because of the way my parents, even with their best intentions, raised me to think about race in our world. Um, and I don't live with my family anymore. I'm still on good terms with them. And as you speak about hard work that needs to be done, I'm wondering what kind of hard work do you think someone like me, a young adult who's recognizing these racist patterns and how we are raised should go back and address those wounds that exist, even though I'm an adult and I don't talk with my family about race that often. <laughs> I love that question, actually. Um, I, so, oh yeah, thank you for the reminder, Amanda. Um, the question is about how this person, as a young person who identifies as white, I think I heard you say, um, Thinking about family, now living, not necessarily in close proximity to family, what's the responsibility or what does it look like to go heal and engage some of the wounded places with the family who did the best they could, and yet some of the modeling and mentoring around showing up in racially just, anti-racist ways wasn't where it perhaps would ideally have been. Is that a fair paraphrase? Okay, good. Um, so I would say when I think about this, all of my family members come to my own mind, um, and I really think that even in relationships where we are not in often close proximity, learning to pay attention to all the different ways that we are connected to family and learning to pay attention to where and how is my identity and who I am and my values in those different ways I'm connected to family articulated. What does it look like? I think leaning in, and, and so, it, so it's a little challenging because every family is different, so what, there's no like one template, right? So some families like to talk about the news, some families avoid the news, but finding ways in your family culture where leaning in and saying, hey, I just had this experience and I wanted to talk about it because it landed, it's landing so differently, differently in my life now than with this way of thinking about values that we had growing up. Or something comes up when you actually are home visiting and you say, you know what, we've never, I've heard this come up before and, I, and we've never actually talked about it, but I need to tell you a little bit about what I've been learning or how I'm thinking about who I am in the world now that actually doesn't align anymore with this way of thinking about how we talk to one another. Whatever it might be, I just deeply believe for our own wholeness and also not in a utilitarian way, but like I think we have a moral responsibility to engage other white folks that looking for the conversation, whatever that looks like in your family culture, as a way of, I talk about it in the book, is keeping my values on my sleeve all the time. Doesn't always mean picking a fight when I go home. Doesn't always mean winning. It means never hiding my values, no matter what. And sometimes you do that and it will result in an argument or a fight anyway, right? Because we can be experienced. I mean, like I tell a story in the book about one time just Someone at the dinner table said, what are you teaching this semester? And I said, 
reparations, you know, and then the, that, that was like, I provoked a fight, right? Um, I bet I could have said, I'm teaching history. I knew it would, I knew I was going to get something for that, but that would, and that would have been truthful, but it would have been not wearing my values in my sleeve. So I was like, all right, I'm going to say reparations and then we see what happens, which, you know, it was not very pretty, but next, you know, so I think of it, stay in it, stay in it, stay in it, stay in it until it's time to leave. There's a time that sometimes boundaries have to happen, but, um, families are one of the places, not always, but you, I mean, your family relationships, you talk about it over long term. If transformation takes time, I could describe for you now different ways of talking about race with different members of my family that over a conversation I've been having with for 30 years with some members of my family, and one of them still looks like this, and still I get mad when we talk, and another one, like, it's over here. And another thing, Jack, you say in your book, when we protest, part of what we're protesting, we protest so that others see what needs to be protested. Every time we're in family, we're also showing other members of our family what it can look like. And you never know where that's going to land ultimately. Real seeds can get planted when you take that risk. So those are some of the ways I think about it in my own walk with my own family. And I'm 53, and it's still not where I wish it was, I'll be honest. And it probably never will be. But So you also need people who would love you up as you do it. I love that answer. I love that answer. And I want to add to it the self-work, um, this idea of the parenting ourselves. So there's this work in the dynamic, because we are in this dynamic with our families. They're the container in which we became, and they are the container in which we're still becoming. So even the family we're not talking to, even the people you broke up with are still in the container with you. They're in there, right? It's like, oh, Bob Johnson is still at the table. He died 20 years ago, but he's still there. I mean, they're still inside us as what a psychologist would call objects. But the, the relationship is inside you. So in the parenting yourself department, adding to that fantastically perfect answer, is to, be, to do some self-work. And we can do that with therapy. In my book, um, I have this thing about the power of stories and knowing our story. So there's a way to kind of just do journaling about yourself, asking yourself, how did I get here? What part of this, how did that story, that time my mom said, blah, 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 how did that shape that part of me that's armor or the part of me that's broken? I think it's important to investigate our stories. And that's not to me narcissism. That's essential to being a grown-up is to know how you got here and why. And when you're parenting yourself, then you can put other objects in the place of that one. Like, I'm going to have my chosen family is going to celebrate this part with me. Um, I'm going to maybe confront Grandma Johnson, next time at the table, because I need to for me to be okay. And you don't know that until you're doing the work on yourself. So it is a, a both a, an individual journey toward being an anti racist and an inside your family journey. And all the white people I know, all the people I know, no matter what color they are, have injuries around race in America. And so the work on that is individual, so we can be the strongest, bestest ally we can be and I encourage you to, to do that kind of self-reflection, you know. This gentleman over here had a question. That was perfect. Right that perfect. Thank you all so much. I so enlightening, so powerful. And I, I love the uh, the love narrative because that you, that's just incredible. You're actually preemptive love ahead of time. So you know how to respond to it. So I think that that's fascinating and beautiful. Um, I was wondering, right now, I'm noticing a lot of um, uh, white authors of anti-racism and, and uh, uh, getting pushback from black writers uh, for, you know, for not being centered or whatever. You know, and I actually, I think some of that uh, criticism is misguided. But I wonder, do you think that some of that pushback is a result of, well, I'm just curious as to what you feel about that. I'm just, yeah. Thanks. The question is, um, so this person's noticing that some white authors talking about race and racism are getting some pushback sometimes from black authors and question about what I think about that. Is that, but it, you know, um, so uh, there's a, there's a couple of things. So I, 
I think when that I I experience or when I hear that pushback, I interpret it as appropriate and healthy suspicion about how often white folks can take over anything. And so that's sort of my first lens through hearing and appreciating that, right? I also hear appropriate, legitimate, wisdom-informed assessment of how often white folks speak before we know what we're talking about, right? So, and, and a tendency that can really emerge in, I mean, any of us can do it, but it's certainly prominent in, you know, the amount of, of anti-racism work that some white folks think happens only around books. You know, please, books are very important. Please read books and buy books. But it's that's, you know, I've ha- I used to, sometimes my students would say, I'm so glad that I had this class because how else would I have learned about anti-racism in a college class? And I would say, wow, you know what? Lots and lots of folks never go to college or never had the access to go to college and know a lot about racism, right? So it doesn't just happen in these, right? So that's another piece of it. I hear an, a, an appropriate suspicion around kind of this sort of, um, you know, that race, anti-racism is intellectual and that we speak before we actually know which we speak, right? Do Am I grounded in communities of accountability that are multiracial? Do people of color read and affirm my work? That question should always be asking white folks. But the the part of it that then I, I do want to claim and own, and I do it somewhat vulnerably, is that there is a reality of how racialization happens such that unless you've been racialized white and raised by a white family, there is a part of this work that I know in a different way than someone who's black, right? And I think of it a little bit like, as a queer person, when I was coming out as queer, I had to face all this stuff in my family, right? To be able to claim a different sense of my own identity. And it was risky and it was costly and it was hard. And it was like, how do I find a place to do that when the people who are charged with knowing and loving me and mentoring and supporting me, like they're dangerous to me. In some ways, whiteness is similar. The same folks, who are supposed to be caring for you, have fed you this poison. So how do you, and there's toxins in all of, fa- all of our families, but the race piece for white folks, there's just, we've been, we got poured into at developmentally vulnerable ages, this supremacist toxin that is, it's, in, it's all, we're all ingesting it all, but, our, but in the kick in, in our families of origin, if we are African American, it's less likely that anti-blackness was, I mean, that anti-blackness was poured in development. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I'm not, it's all in the air. But if you're being sort of having anti-blackness poured into you when you're one years old, two years old, three, and then at age 15, you're saying like, wait a second, something's wrong with the, who do you turn to? And so I think there's a piece of white folks modeling for other white folks while in long-term accountable relationships with people of color in movement, not just intellectual thoughts, it is actually vital for multiracial justice movements because white folks need to see other white body people, people racialized as white, modeling what it looks like to go to your in-law's house and say, we need to talk about what just happened with this two-year-old baby doll because it's a different conversation. So I think there's a space for white folks to be in this conversation if we are also in daily activist social change work as we go and are incredibly humble about how we do it. I think it's actually really necessary. I think it's necessary too. And I would, I want to add something to that, that, and yet, right. And yet George Floyd is murdered and you can't buy an anti-racist book in Barnes and Noble or on Amazon or anywhere because all the white converts wrote books about anti-racism. I just want to put that alongside what I really agree with with Jen. You have to have white people writing about race, working on race, teaching on race, talking race has to happen. And the, and the way whiteness works in America, though, is you could write a shitty book, and people did. But I'm a white person who used to be a white supremacist, and I've been converted. What the F? You know? Um, just like I'm an evangelical. Let me say this after. Just like yesterday, I was an, in, an evangelical white supremacist, <laughs> and I saw Jesus, and I wrote a book. And I'm on a national book tour about the book, and I'm making tons of money about it because everybody wants to know the three white people who used to be racist yesterday but are not today. 
and they get a TV show and a book and a T-shirt. That's, that's true, too. So some of the pushback is just the way whiteness works, the way capitalism works, the way we want to see a hero because the hero did the work. Jen is our hero. Jennifer did the work. Ooh, let's give her a book deal. Thank you, God, that she got a book deal. But you understand what I'm saying? And it's not the women. It's those white guys, all those white guys who last week were racist, who are going to get big book deals for converting. And white people are going to buy the book, and they're going to read the book, and they're going to feel like they've done their work because the recent convert wrote the book. That's the pushback. And it should be a pushback because um, that's bullshit. And, and the way whiteness works is it's going to keep coming that way. And I'm a little mad at it. <laughs> I'm a little mad at, like, I know I'm sick of white, I'm especially sick of white men converting and getting all the kudos. I would really like, I like the white women, I especially like the queer white women, but I'm sick of the white straight man convert story. Y'all hear that on my Insta? <laughs> Share that. Okay, let's, let's read some black people struggle. Let's, let's invite some young black activists. Invite Jawanza Williams to come talk to you about some stuff because he knows some stuff. Stop aggrandizing white people who saw the light that they should have seen six years ago. And if they saw the light, make some reparations. Right, Jen? Put some money back on it. You know, publish some other young author who did put, move to the neighborhood. Live with the black people that you just converted to love. That's what I'm talking about. Makes me angry. Keep going. I, I mean, just really, like, that's not the work. Like, go to, go shop in a black grocery store, buy your child some black dolls, tweet your children some black books, stop banning the books, take your children to the library and find the books. That's the work. And if the if Penguin House and when, you know, and Harper Collins don't understand how to find some authors who have really done their work who really have done their work, and also the black writers who really done their work and can't get a book deal. It's just, just a feeling I have. Sorry. Oh, good. <laughs> Sorry, I can stop talking. And then just repeat the question, please. Uh, this is a question and comment. The question says, how do you navigate safety with this hard work? White supremacy is violent, and often the hard work costs us our safety, not comfort, but safety. How do you navigate safety and do with that hard work? I, um, well, oh, you need it's, not, it's, not, it's not safe. Oh, yeah. How do you navigate safety when doing this hard work um, to, let's say, dismantle white supremacy? It is not easy. It is hard. And it's not always safe. And that's the truth. Uh, those children who were sitting at the lunchroom counters trying to integrate them, who had to learn how to do nonviolent protest and get themselves hit in the head with ketchup bottles and salt bottles, they weren't safe. The people who marched for voting rights were not safe. They were brave, but they were not safe. If they were integrating a bus, they were not safe. If they were deciding to drink from a, a, a segregated water fountain, they weren't safe. So safe. Safe is not really necessarily what's going to happen. I think sometimes we're going to be brave and not safe. I want to invite you to guard your heart. I want you to take care of yourself. I'm not saying run into a burning building, but I think the risk we take to make the world better is sometimes we're not safe. We're just brave. Okay, yeah, let's do, unless we have another burning one, we'll have, let this be the last question, if that's all right. Uh, thank you, thank you both for that. Uh, I kind of have a follow-up to that question. I think being both a Black person and a Christian, you know, sometimes it's difficult to figure out what are the limits of nonviolent resistance and what are the limits of nonviolent love, um, especially when we think about the fact that, for example, slavery might not have ended if we didn't actually have the Civil War, right? And that was a very violent event. Um, so I guess my question, and also thinking about the story that you told about your, your mother and how she was fiercely protecting you and she, she was willing to get violent to make sure that her child was safe. So I guess that's my question. Like, how do we hold those things in tension that sometimes we don't actually get to the other side without these acts of self-defense and self-preservation? Yeah. 
I'm going to give you the last word because it's your book. Watch. Um, my thoughts on that, I got a question like that the other day on my page. And I, you know, to be honest with you, if somebody's coming after my grandchildren, you know, I am probably going to fight for them. If someone came into my church to cause us harm, I'm probably going to fight. I'm not going to buy a gun to fight. I'm not going to buy a gun to fight. I'm not going to pull the trigger to fight. But I'm going to fight first with a community of wisdom and learning and love and try to see if we can talk our way to another place, teach our way, love our way to another place. But it's really honest to say it's scary out there. And sometimes someone's going to come to blows. I'm not going to judge you if you come to blows. I'm saying nonviolence is better to my mind. And we didn't get to human rights in the, in the United States with violence. We got here with nonviolence. That's my proof text. And also, if you're listening to this and you're in an unsafe place, get out of it. If you're listening to this and you are in harm's way, walk away. Don't stand there and get your behind beat for nonviolence. We don't have to do that. But I think we need strategies that are as nonviolent as possible because violence begets violence. And I'm sorry, Mr. Trump got shot in the ear because he promotes violence. And he didn't die not because people prayed for him and God saved him. He didn't die because the person was a poor shot. Violence is only going to beget violence. What do you think? So I came into any of this work in my, in my own life and was challenged in it most fully. Um, and a couple of folks in this room were in this space at Union Theological Seminary um, back when I was in my early 20s. And so when I hear your question about violence and the role of violence, but the first thing, because I sat deeply and studied deeply in that space, was I heard Dr. Cohn's voice saying, well, who's violence, right? Who's violence are we talking about? Um, and so I, you know, whatever my own sensibilities and proclivities around the question of violence, I always try and hear it through his re rejoinder on that front. And from my sort of, if I think about my own walk, I think my thoughts are very much akin to what Jackie has just shared about hers, which is, well, the other thing I thought about, I was shocked a few years ago to to learn that Rosa Parks actually for a time, she, she, she did, she believed in self-defense and had a gun. Right. Um, so I, I too, I think if I think about self-defense, that feels like one set of moral questions for me. And if I think about organizing strategy and the collective, I do deeply believe that in the main violence does beget more violence. Um, and that I loved actually the phrase you said is as not as nonviolent as possible. Um, because I just, like, we're, 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 we're going to tear this world apart. But again, start and end with Dr. Cohn, who's violence, and, and, and what is mine to say. So I'll just leave it there. Thanks for the question. It's a great question. Thank you all for these questions. Well, Jackie asked me to wrap the evening, but you know I'm going to wrap it with two more questions, right? Very, very brief ones. And um, Dr. Harvey, I'll actually start with you. You mentioned at the beginning, which I think is the premise of your new book, though I haven't read it yet, um, which is essentially, I'm, I can testify to this and I've witnessed it, that the work of anti-racism for white people is often so heady. Why do you think it's so hard to make it the sole work that it actually requires? Wow, that's such a good question. And I think it has something to do with our heads are very safe places. I mean, not always, but our bodies, putting our bodies in spaces where our bodies learn to do different things, to feel different things, to sense different things. That's really the work of where the work of transformation happens, I believe, when it comes to anti-racism. And so... I can sit and sort of think intellectually till, till, you know, till the cows come home. Is that a thing we say in New York City? I don't know. Uh, we say it in Iowa. Um, 
it, but it doesn't ask anything of me. And it also doesn't change my behavior. That a phrase in the book over and over I say is anti-racism is a behavior. Behavior is the hardest part because behavior is the wholeness of the self. So we're not served by the mind-body split. And so I think there's something about that that's in the why. Our bodies need to get in the rooms that we need to be in for the transformation and work to happen. Our intellect is part of it, but it's the easiest part. That's great. And now, Reverend Dr. Lewis, my question for you, I've been sitting here thinking so much about something that was said at the beginning of this conversation, which is um, essentially creating a space for love to land. And I can think of no one who does that as well as you, specifically with Middle Church, the church where Jackie's been a senior pastor for 20 years. And what I would love for you to leave us with is how have you done that? And specifically with this lens of um, anti-racism with its partner, Fierce Love, I've heard you speak a lot about specifically how your anti-racism work has even shifted yourself within that congregation. So in, in whatever breath and energy you have left that you'd like to share with us how you have created this beautiful multiracial place for love to land, I think we would, I know we would all benefit from hearing that. Mm. Yeah, Amanda's asking a question about how, um, how we create a space for love to land, a, a brave and safe-ish anti-racist, um, multi-ethnic place for it to land at Middle Church. Um, Dr. King was killed at Jen when I was almost nine, and that, Chicago erupted in violence, and I was like, I was both traumatized and activated. I really did feel in this kind of uh, preternatural way that I was supposed to do his work um, when I was nine. I thought that I was supposed to do that, and I do feel like I'm supposed to do that, but I can't do it by myself. So the way I make a safe and brave place is to have a community in which you're a part of it. All of us together make it a safe. We look differently. We think differently. We bring our little multi-culty selves together. And somebody comes to the door and they see somebody that's kind of like them. Oh, that blonde girl from Kentucky and that, that trans man from, you know, the Bronx. Or like all of us, all of the people at Middle make Middle the safe and brave place that they walk by the all Chinese church to come to this church, that they walk by the black church to come to this church, that they come to this laboratory to experience what it might be like to try to be together. The thing I do, I think, is lead with vulnerability. And I also lead with fierce love. I am vulnerable AF, but I am fierce also. My love is fierce. I'm demanding you are not we had, a, we had a class one time where we called it like human sexuality. And these people found it online and they came and they were like, so um, we don't understand why you let like, queer people be in the church. And I was like, you got to go. You got to go. Like zero tolerance. You got to go. That's not what this class is for. This, you're not, you didn't come to, I didn't invite you to convince me. And, I, and I, that's called a boundary and that's called fierce love. So get out. This is not for you. So everything doesn't go. Love goes. Justice goes, welcome goes. And I think if we create containers of vulnerability and structure and love, then we can uh, be a place where love lands. Amen. Amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's do it up. Jen Harvey, everyone.